Well, good evening. Let's say that one more time. Good evening. evening. How about I turn it on? That might even work better. There we go. Good evening. Third time's a charm. My name is Dr. Drew Flam, and I serve as the president of Grace College and Seminary, and we are thrilled to welcome you here this evening. We are in for a treat. Tonight, we get to indulge in the treasure of music. We will be moved, we will be encouraged, and we will make Christ known through this good gift. Tonight, we center our theme around angels, these created beings that can be difficult for us to understand sometimes especially for children. And here's what a few children said, commenting about angels. Olivia, age five, said this. I only know the names of two angels, Hark and Harold. (laughs) Matthew, age eight, commented, it's not easy becoming an angel. First you die, then you go to heaven, and then there's flight training school to go to, and then you have to agree to wear those clothes. And Tanya, age six, said this, My guardian angel helps me with my math, but he's not much good at science. (laughs) I would agree with that. We don't know everything about angels, but we know that they have the same mission we do, and that's to bring glory and honor to God. And we get to join with these musicians tonight to do just that. Psalms 98.4 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Well, we want to thank our director and esteemed Grace alum, Eric Chris, for his faithfulness to directing the Grace Wind Ensemble since 2017. And we have a long legacy of wonderful directors. And always beside him, his wife, Rochelle, who is returning this evening as our narrator and thankful for her as well. And of course, we want to thank all of the musicians for leading us in this joyous praise of God this evening. Thank you. Well, my main role is to pray for us, so let me do that now. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity to enjoy this gift of music that you have given us. We thank you that you are the great director that you have directed all of creation to bring praise and honor and glory to yourself. And we thank you that we get to join in that as we play, as we listen, as we think and consider the beautiful gift of music and how it causes us to worship you. We thank you for sending your son Jesus, who has come, and as we think about the Christmas season that these songs will lead us to be thinking about, coming as a a baby, uh, wrapped in flesh for us, so that we could know you and be a part of your family. We praise you for Jesus. Pray for the musicians this evening, director, all those participating, that they would enjoy even as they play. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Flam, and thank you, Grace College. And thank you for choosing to spend your evening with us. My name is Rochelle Chris, and I'd like to welcome you to Good Tidings of Great Joy. Please join me in welcoming our director, Eric Chris, and the Grace College Wind Ensemble. children, Dr. Flam just described to us, if I asked you to close your eyes and picture an angel, what image would come to your mind? A chubby baby-like being floating on a cloud? A man dressed in glowing white robes with wings, a harp, and a halo? Or this time of year, maybe you would see a bumbling elderly man who needs to earn his wings like Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life. We often substitute what Hollywood and artists have imagined to be true about angels in place of reality. So tonight we're going to challenge what we think we know about angels through scripture and music. Although we can't see them and don't often acknowledge their existence, angels are real. The Bible gives us a sneak peek into what angels are really like. 
God's word tells us that angels are created beings and trusted servants of God with many jobs to do. One job outlined in 2 Samuel 14, 17 is to discern good from evil. A tone poem by Stephen Reinecke tells a thrilling transcendental tale of good and evil inspired by the story of twin sisters born in Germany in 1588. In the 16th century, twin females were considered a bad omen and it quickly became apparent that these sisters were both gifted with second sight and able to tell the future from their visions. Neither sister was able to conform to society's idea of normal and both led drastically different lives as a result. Separated at birth, Sibylla was raised at home where the townspeople feared her and labeled her as a witch. While Helena was sent to a convent and became revered as a prophet and a saint for the same gift. After Sibylla is imprisoned, Helena comes home to rescue her sister. As they escape, the sisters are captured and Helena dies in Sibylla's arms. One sister was persecuted and punished while the other was celebrated. So was one sister truly born evil and one born good? Or were society's evils forced upon two good women? Perhaps only the angels know. Stephen Reinecke's composition explores the tug of war between good and evil in The Witch and the Saint.
There is an old saying that states having children is like having your heart walk around outside your body. God's word tells us that children are a gift and a reward from him. And if some of us here tonight were being honest, we may have a few questions about that. Because some of us have experienced children who like to test the limits. Some of us might have some future athletes that may wish to test the laws of gravity, for example. So maybe you have a child who likes to jump from the highest point of the house to the lowest. Or maybe they're trying to set a new personal best by uh, seeing how many seconds they can shave off their run while having you chase them. Or some children with a more mechanical bent might like to do a quick check on the plumbing to see how much the toilet can flush down at one time. <clears throat> and then when they're older, they're, they're so much more thoughtful and they test your electrical system by seeing how many devices can charge in one socket before a breaker blows, no power strip or surge strip required. Future scientists and doctors and nurses may start their scientific experimenting a little early with their own immune systems by doing things like drinking out of dog bowls or eating things directly off the ground while hollering five second rule. I work with fourth graders, I know that that's true. Despite all of this experimentation, children generally survive the perils of childhood unscathed and then these precious bundles grow up way too quickly and go on to have children of their own. Grandchildren, I'm told, is one of life's greatest joys. And wise King Solomon must have agreed when he penned Proverbs 17:6, saying, children's children are crowned to the aged. And we may joke about children's guardian angels, but in truth, they do have them, perhaps because they need them. Jesus said in Matthew 18:10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. On Angel's Wings by Ed Huckabee is a sweet dreamlike lullaby written to honor his own grandchildren, who like all children across the world clearly hold a special place in God's heart.
One of life's greatest mysteries is what happens to our souls after we pass away. Scripture doesn't give us all the answers, but it does indicate that those who have faith in God will be escorted to heaven by angels. In Luke 16, Jesus tells the parable of a rich man who lived in luxury and dressed in fine linen each day. While the rich man was alive, he ignored God and the needs of others, including a beggar named Lazarus who lived at his gate. Covered in sores, Lazarus lived off the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And then the time came when each man passed away. The rich man who had only lived for himself ended up living eternity in misery, separated from God and begging for Lazarus to be sent to him with a small drop of water to relieve his agony. Lazarus, who had had nothing in life but his faith, was escorted to heaven by angels and ushered safely into the comfort and presence of God. Afterlife by Rosanna Galante studies the developing consciousness of those with faith like Lazarus awakening in paradise to find that the suffering and pain of the physical world have been left behind for the comfort and peace only found in the presence of the sea.
Some of you may recall seeing footage of John Glenn sitting in the cockpit of his friendship capsule. When these historic words were spoken, Godspeed, John Glenn. Godspeed is an term we frequently hear or use, but perhaps it's one that carries a particular significance because of its rarity. Of course, it's an expression of good wishes for the success of a person at the beginning of a journey, but it also invokes thoughts of God's protection for the traveler. One of the greatest examples of God's protection is when the Israelites began their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. God sent an angel ahead to guard them along the way and to bring them into the land he had promised to them. Godspeed by Stephen Malelo begins with all the exuberance and hectic chaos that marks the beginning of a journey. But in the middle, we find that quiet reverence, a peace and a stillness, which only comes from the protection of the one who camps his angels around those who fear him.
imagine with me a still, dark, starry night long, long ago. The only sounds come from the bleeding sheep scattered over the hillside and the crackling fire built by shepherds settling down for the night. Miraculously, a stranger appears, terrifying the poor men. His incandescent light lifts the veil of night. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is the setting for angels in the bleak and winter, arranged by Larry.
In November 1990, a new family Christmas movie was released and an instant classic was born. No Christmas movie marathon would be complete without precocious eight-year-old Kevin McAllister defending his house from the wily wet bandits all by himself after accidentally being left home alone while his family jets off to a Christmas vacation in Paris. The movie's success began a string of sequels, including Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. <coughs> Writing Christmas music for two full-length movies may have been a daunting task for any but the legendary John Williams. Using sleigh bells and, and in some cases, inspiration from Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, John Williams crafted music that helped propel Home Alone to Christmas icon status and made it a staple of American Christmas culture. Arranged by Paul Lavender, we hope that a Home Alone Christmas will always live somewhere in your memories.
America's bandmaster, John Philip Sousa, the March King, is the man responsible for bringing the Marine Band to an unmatched standard of excellence. His is a name we generally associate with the patriotic sentiments of the 4th of July. His most significant works were for the military band, the most notable of those works being the Stars and Stripes Forever. The Stars and Stripes was once noted in a White House memorandum as an integral part of the celebration of American life. So you may be wondering how this song fits into a concert segment about Christmas. And so am I. <laughs> Our director, however, assures me that maybe we should take a second look, or literally a second listen, to the Stars and Stripes, arranged by Robert Foster. I'm assured that there are hidden gems ingeniously embedded that we surely have missed hearing before. So let's humor him and take a closer listen to the Stars and Stripes for Christmas. Christmas songs in America is Sleigh Ride, and it was not intended to be a Christmas too. Leroy Anderson had recently been discharged from the Army after World War II 
and was at home digging trenches to deal with a plumbing issue in the middle of a July heat wave when he began composing Sleigh Ride. According to his wife, Anderson hoped to write a song that represented the fun activities of the entire winter season. No matter what his intentions, Anderson's song captured the nostalgia of a bygone era when people traveled over hard-packed <coughs> snow in sleighs pulled by horses wearing sleigh bells. Sleigh bells being the official sound of the holiday season immediately set the idea of Christmas in the listener's mind. And a new Christmas classic was adopted into the lexicon of American Christmas carols. So come on, it's lovely weather for a sleigh ride together with you. 